Welcome everyone to the Korea Herald Books episode. We're your hosts, Beth and Naomi. We're both copy editors at the Korea Herald. For regular listeners of the Korea Herald podcast, this is a special episode in which we have an in-depth conversation about a work of Korean literature that has been translated into English. We will provide details about all the works we discuss in the show notes. Today, we have a very special guest, Bora Chung. Bora Chung is a writer and translator. Her book, Cursed Bunny, here I have the Korean original version and Naomi has English. Um, it has been long listed for the annual International Booker Prize, along with 12 other works, including Love in the Big City by Korean author Sang Young Park, also translated by Anton Her, who was a translator for Cursed Bunny. The shortlist will be announced on April 7th and the final winner on May 26th. And I think, Naomi, isn't there another Korean book that won this prize? Yes, absolutely. So The Vegetarian by Han Gang won the prize in 2016. Mm, that's right. But let's dive into this novel right here. Cursed Bunny is a collection of 10 short stories that blur the lines between magical realism, horror, and science fiction. Using elements of the fantastic and surreal, the stories address the very real horrors and cruelties of patriarchy and capitalism in modern society. Well, welcome to the Korea Herald podcast studio, Bora. It's really good to have you here, and congratulations on the nomination. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Bora Chung, and thank you for having me here today. So how does it feel to be nominated for this prize? I am shocked. Suddenly, people are mentioning my name in the same sentence with um, Han Gang and Olga Tokarchuk, and um, I, I feel this is surreal. I, I don't, I'm not on that caliber, I don't think, but it's a great honor. What was your first reaction? Do you, did you celebrate? No, not really. I was at the Women's March on March 8th, and Hunt for Star, they emailed me, and um, Anthony and Taylor were almost crying. They were so excited, but oh. they told me I had to zip it, and they <laughs> gave me a gag order until the Booker International officially posted the long list. So um, for two days, I was thinking, this has to be a dream, but it's a nice dream. And then... <laughs> Everybody's celebrating, and everybody's so happy. Anton is really happy, and good for him. He put two of his translations on the long list. He is amazing, and everybody at Barzak is crazy happy. And I went there. They summoned me to sign 1,000 copies of the third edition, and one of their translators brought me carrot cake for the bunny, and the cake was good, so I'm very happy about the cake. Yeah, carrot cake's the best. I think I would be very happy too. <laughs> um, our first question is, what kind of mythologies did you draw on for the short stories in this collection? Mythology, I grew up on Korean mythology, especially Samguk um, the unreal stories of Shilla. They are fascinating, and you can feel that um, during that era, people actually lived with the gods. It's the same in every culture. If you go back in time enough, then people actually lived with the gods and they believed that all the spirits and fairies um, habited the earth with them. Th that kind of worldview um, is, is still fascinating to me. I love it. And I am trained as a Russian scholar, so I read I had to read a lot of Russian mythology as well, and they're so fun and so very different. They were so distinct, um, so Slavic mythology. Mm -hmm. And um, I am ashamed to admit, but I really like Japanese war stories and <laughs> urban, um, urban legends. So modern Korean Japanese urban legends are still fun and they're very real. So um, if I want to set my stories in the modern era, the, those urban legends really help me. Interesting. So I just wanted to jump in here. So when I read the book, um, I had the same sort of an uncanny feeling I had when watching the Netflix series The Witcher. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, um, but it makes a lot of sense because The Witcher is also the show 
is based on novels by this Polish author, Andrzej Sapkowski. Yes, Andrzej Um Am I saying that right? <laughs> and he, you know, draws on a myriad of Slavic mythology or Eastern European influences. And so when I read it, I sort of had a flashback um, to when I was watching the Witcher series. I binge watched it through the whole two seasons (laughs) through quarantine. But that sort of dark and sort of squeamish and like um, horror part really, really got to me, Um, which actually brings me to, you know, the next question. So a lot of the short stories you write read like sort of a twisted folktale and leaning more into the horror than sci-fi and fantasy. I wanted to ask, you know, what is it about these dark themes that really fascinate you? Um, First of all, I want to think that there is more to this world than our five senses can can perceive. Um, Human beings are very small. We can be great and we can be beautiful, but human beings are very small and we're just, we are um, one of the species, one of the millions of species that inhabit this earth. And what we think we know can't be all. And I think urban legends and myths and, and legends in general, folk tales, they constantly tell us that what you know is not all, and you should be arrogant enough to think that what your five senses can sense is all there is to feel and perceive and think. So um, those dark themes, um, something that is unexplained and unexplainable and something that people should not dare to explain with their very small knowledge of the universe, um, those themes constantly draw me. And secondly, I don't think I still understand the Korean society that I live in. And I'm, I'm constantly confused. So this entire world that I'm living in is a giant set of confusions. And I describe the world as I see it. So it has to be, my stories come out as confusing and dark. Um, actually, on that note, um, other than the central theme of revenge, you also take on other themes, um, patriarchy, capitalism, womanhood, issues that contemporary Korean society face, as you um, mentioned earlier. I saw these themes in Curse Bunny and Home Sweet Home in particular, and um, I wanted to ask a burning question. How autobiographical is Reunion, the last story in the collection? Because thematically, I found it so distinct. Um, I have to say, um, for the record, the kink is not autobiographical. (laughs) No. (laughs) I spent a year, actually, to be exact, it was 10 months, in Krakow, Poland. And I love, I love the city, I love the country, and um, it's really sad that because of the pandemic, we're not not able to, to travel. Um, but I just love Poland, and I went to the square almost every day um, because after my language classes, I didn't have anything else to do, so <laughs> I went to the square, and the square is real. Um, Adam Mickiewicz's um, um, monument is real, but the guy, the guy with the kink, is not real. <laughs> and my Polish at the time was not that good, so I could not read um, any kind of research material in Polish, so the library is fake. Um, but the old man who crosses this, the square every day, that's actually someone I saw uh, in the last century um, it, when I was a college student in Xinchon. Uh, I was sitting with a friend at, at Central Metro Station, and um, everybody else is like rushing by. And there's this old man who is limping, who looks very uncomfortable walking, um, going in one direction, but he was moving surreally fast. It was it was incredible. He was incredibly fast, but he was limping, and he looked very labored. And he was going the, this one single direction. And then about three minutes later, he appeared again. And he was going that same direction in the exact same fashion, like in labored limping. And then he would appear again. So I asked my friend, did you see that? And he said, yeah. So we were like st- staring at him for about 10, 15 minutes. And he kept going one direction. And then, then we didn't see him coming back. 
And that's just not possible. So we got really scared and went home. Yeah, I wanted to actually, I mean, a lot of, you said you were inspired by a lot of like Japanese horror um, legends, myths. Have you had any like personal supernatural experiences? No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all in your imagination. Though. Yes. Um, that old guy was the one time that I had anything near to a supernatural um, occurrence, but he looked real enough. And maybe he knows a secret passageway that we don't know. I don't, I don't know. And he didn't do any harm. He was just walking. Of all the, you know, of all the themes in the 10 short stories, um, Beth did mention this yesterday to me in her notes. She noted how, um, especially um, in The Snare, The Head, and Cursed Bunny, in three of those stories, one theme is, you know, the parents' greed for um, superficial wealth and um, gold ends up harming their children and their bodies. Um, and a lot of these folk tales, the recurring motif, or folk tales in general, recur recurring motif is, you know, nothing is ever as it seems, and it always seems to have some sort of moral lesson. Is this what you intended for these stories, to have some sort of moral lesson, or um, did you have any message, uh, specific, particular messages that you wanted to deliver through these themes no. about Korean society? <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, the one message that I wanted to deliver was, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I am so confused. Um, that's, that's the one coherent theme in all my stories, I think. <laughs> I am so scared and I'm so confused. Um, actually, uh, the president of Arzag chose, uh, among my short stories, chose those 10 stories and put in that exact order in the book. And he specifically told me that this first sentence in head has to go to the first page so that the reader um, can pick up the book, open the first page, and be hooked <laughs> instantly. And I don't know about project planning or publishing, so OK. <laughs> and I think his plan worked. Um, he is an amazing publisher and, and uh, uh, What's the word for it? Um, yeah, he, he is an amazing editor. And um, I think he has a very good sense of how to order the stories and how to theme the book. So it's his selection of themes and not mine. I just, I just write stories as they, as they come to me. And then Anton came to this book fair and he picked up the book and he saw the first sentence and he told me that he wanted to translate my story as soon as he saw the first sentence. So yes, he was hooked. <laughs> they hooked the right person. <laughs> wow. Now I'm here. <laughs> it's destiny. But do you have a personal favorite from this collection um, off the top of your head? Um, Goodbye, My Love is my favorite. I <clears throat> It was inspired by my students when I was still teaching. So I have a sentimental attachment to the story. and. Anton agrees that there's a strange twisted satisfaction when the narrator is killed by robots in the end. Did I spoil the story? <laughs> Actually, I wanted to say I, I like that story as well because it really reminded me of a short story I read in The New Yorker called Out There. And it's very similar to this uh, reflection on AI bots and what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to have intimacy, human connection in this like rapidly changing world? And so like I, I honestly felt um, really great recognition that the th this theme that I saw there is reflected here. And I think you actually captured it really well. So yeah. Thank you. The story is actually about my phone. I, I actually I heard that from the yeah another um, interview you did. It's about your old mobile phone, yes. right? <laughs> and the attachment you felt to yes. Um, yeah. I'm still really sad that I had Chris, to let it go. Curious, what kind of phone was it? Um, it was a BlackBerry Torch. Oh. And BlackBerry users have this um, have this strange attachment to their phones. I think the rate is higher for BlackBerry users than other phone users. Is it because of the QWERTY keyboard? I guess so, yes. 
I still remember my first mobile phone, a Nokia, black and white, and you can only play that snake game. Oh, <laughs> mine was an LG flip phone. It was a brick. Like, I literally could have thrown it at a wall and <laughs> it would have survived. Break the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, for you, what was the hardest or most challenging story to write among this collection? The head is the first and the first is always the hardest. I think I I didn't learn how to write. I didn't take any classes. I never learned how to do this. So I was I was um, figuring out on my own, and um, I really had a hard time with the first page. So I I wanted to write about a head coming out of the toilet. That I was sure. But I didn't know how to go about it and what would happen later afterwards. So I wrote, uh, first time I wrote this very realistic story about a woman freaking out when she finds out that a head is coming out of her toilet. And I wrote a full description um, in one page and I showed it to my sister and she said, this is boring. <laughs> So um, I decided to go the opposite way. So the head comes out of the toilet, and she doesn't freak out, and she has this very authoritarian conversation in um, what sounds like middle-aged Korean. No, I mean um, 15th or 16th century Korean, or in a, a period piece. And um, my sister was satisfied, <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> she's happy. Um, and I thought this um, old Korean sounding tone fit the story, the atmosphere of the story. So um, everybody else, if they have a line, they speak modern Korean, but the head speaks strangely old style period piece kind of Korean. Mm -hmm. And my friends um, commented on that after they read it. And they also said they're not able to go to the bathroom anymore. <laughs> they blame me. Yeah, I, I yeah. like definitely like double checked my toilet after. <laughs> Yeah, um, the head was definitely memorable for me too, um, and I, yeah, I, I really can't, couldn't get the imagery out of my mind, but it's really interesting that um, you mentioned the language of the head, because that's something that um, I, I didn't actually um, think about, because it's translated into English, but mm -hmm. I guess if we read the original Korean, we could get that nuance that um, uh, the mm -hmm. translated version doesn't. Uh, maybe you can't capture as well as the original, like, you know, Korean. Um, Anton did a superb job, and he actually discussed it with me. Mm -hmm. um, this is not going to deliver very well in English, and mm -hmm. do you mind if I translate it into more readable English? And I said, it's, it's your project, so <laughs> do whatever you want. <laughs> Just do your magic. And he, the English um, delivers what I'm trying to say better than the Korean because in the Korean I'm fumbling with words and he knows exactly what I'm trying to say. I don't know how he does it. Mm. I've been translating for 23, 23 years and I'm never going to be as good as Anton. <laughs> um, speaking about translation, you do translate um, Russian literature into Korean and I hear that you usually try to translate um, works that have not been translated for or lesser known works. Um, do you have any recommendations um, of Russian authors that you think deserve greater recognition? I think um, modern female authors are generally good. Um, Lyudmila, uh, Petrushevskaya and Yudmila Ulitskaya, Tatiana Tolstaya, these authors are the three women postmodern Russian authors that are, are leading um, Russian literature. But also, um, surprisingly, all the authors in the mystery and um, crime thriller field in Russia are women because Alexandra Marinina, who used to be a cop, um, started writing mysteries and detective stories after the Soviet Union fell. And during the Soviet Union for 70 years, 
um, civilians were not allowed to know about how an investigation, how a criminal investigation worked. You know, um, mostly the Soviet secret police brought in the subject and tortured the hell out of him, and then got us confession, and it was not very good. So um, Alexander Marinina knew how investigation worked in, in the Soviet and post-Soviet Russian reality, and she made a field out of it. She, she is the creative uh, creator of the Russian detective field, and she's still active. Um, she's been writing for 30 years, and her um, protagonist um, matures with her. So she has a 60-year-old um, woman detective who is dealing with her own personal life and attacking, um, criti criticizing major social problems in Russia. Um, and she is, she is amazing. And I want to be like her when I grow up. Um, yeah, we will definitely have to get those authors and put them in the show notes and check them out. Um, are there any upcoming projects that you're working on that you can tell us about? I was working on a novel um, about painkillers and what pain is in general. But that was before the pandemic, and then the pandemic hit, and I have to reconceptualize everything <laughs> because um, being sick now has a new meaning. So I... I'm in trouble, <laughs> in the deep trouble. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say during this yeah pandemic, like you say you sort of write to, you know, try help make sense of the world and Korean society. And this pandemic has been a great sort of a big lesson. And has it in any way sort of um, affected, you know, or reshaped your your thoughts about um, certain issues in Korea or th what you mentioned about pain, understanding pain and sickness? Well, on a social, societal level, not really. I just reconfirmed what I learned before the pandemic that the, um, the more vulnerable classes, the disabled, the elderly, the women, the children, they are more susceptible to, to the disease or economic crisis or both. That, um, that we have to protect the more vulnerable class to protect ourselves because this pandemic taught us that if one person gets sick, then everybody gets sick. No, it's not. It, it's not possible to isolate ourselves, um, insulate ourselves, um, to the point where everybody else gets sick, but we are safe. That's just not possible. So we have to figure out a way to make everybody safe. That that's the only way we can survive. On a personal level, um, my husband's family as members who are immunocompromised and cannot be vaccinated, it's by doctor's orders. They asked three, four times <laughs> they really wanted to get vaccinated, but the doctor said no. So I'm constantly worried that I might, I might make, make them sick. And <laughs> it's been going on for years now, so um, I'm always worried, but there's really nothing I can do. I am fully vaccinated and boosted, and still I'm worried. And that's all I can do, <laughs> worry. Yeah, um, one question that I want to slip in because we have a bit of extra time. Um, where, where do you see yourself in five or 10 years from now? Like, where do you hope um, to see yourself with your writing and your translation or just with your life in general? That's the thing. I don't think about the future. I think about next week, but not five years. I don't do that, not anymore. Well, I mean, in any case, we're really looking forward to your upcoming works about mm -hmm. painkillers, maybe. Thank <laughs> you. Um, and this has been really such an interesting conversation, um, and I wish we could continue, but we do have to wrap it up for today. Um, thank you so much, Bora, for coming into the Korea, Korea Herald studio to sit down with us and share your thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we're both really honored.
uh, to have this conversation with you today. Thank you to all of our listeners or watchers. Um, we'd love to hear back from you about this episode. Um, leave us a message on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or send us an email. Thank you so much. See you Thank next you. time. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura.